Um, first of all, welcome everyone to the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. I'm Sarah Bartlett, and in 15 days and about six hours, but who's counting, I will be the new dean of this wonderful establishment. Thank you. It's all about me, after all. And uh, anyway, I wanted to uh, just welcome everybody here. This is our first uh, Night Innovation Award. We're thrilled to have it here. Actually, one of the best pieces of news I got when I became the new dean was that this event was happening right away, this fall, and we better get going on it. So uh, one of the many joys of the job is that I get to work uh, with people like Jeff Jarvis. Uh, I've probably spent more time with Jeff in the last eight weeks than I spent in the last seven years. And that's been a good thing for me, because I've found out many, many wonderful things about his personality and kicked him around a little bit, too. So with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, so I also want to welcome you here on behalf of um, the Talent Center for Entrepreneurial Journalism and uh, the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism, and uh, gratitude that the Knight Foundation has made this possible. John Bracken called uh, some uh, longer ago than I want to admit. Uh, saying, uh, do you guys want to hold an innovation award? You seem like the right place to do it. And we said, of course, uh, thank you, yes. And the other good news, when Sarah heard about this, she said, well, next year we're going to make this even a lot bigger. <laughs> so next year is going to be a, a big event. But we're glad that Alberto Marguerite is here, Michael Manus, Marie Gio, who uh, suffered with my uh, ill organization to get here. So thank you all very much. Uh, Leonard Tao from the Tao Foundation is upstairs. He'll be down any second. And Andrea Scholler is here from Tao as well. Um, so uh, I'm grateful to those folks, and uh, this is an award for innovation. The school believes heartily in innovation and a non-never-ending process of change and development and disruption. And so we are proud to uh, be the, the, uh, the house for this, this award, and for the first one this year. Sorry to drag you out on a miserably cold night. Uh, the people from Miami are not complaining, but the one from California is complaining mightily. <laughs> So uh, I want to bring up uh, Michael Maness, who is going to give the first award for uh, uh, the Knight Award for Innovation, and then we'll go on from there. So, Michael. So um, we're really excited about this award. It, it came out of, um, it, it actually has a really long history of moving around different universities. <laughs> so we're happy that it's here. And we're really excited in particular uh, to do it uh, to, for the first recipient. And this was a, a much discussed uh, uh, award for the first one because one, we wanted to make sure that um, the principles of the award were really captured in the first, in the first one that we did it. And it really is about someone who's bringing innovation to the space, has done it, um, has pragmatic results that demonstrate that, who is a thought leader in it and also is trying to drive um, the next steps and where we're going in the space. And there is no one that I think encapsulates that better than our first award winner, Moavida, which is Sue Gardner. Michael. Um, I, I want to thank uh, the Knight Foundation for the honor and opportunity that this represents. I am honored and I am flattered and I am also a little bit nervous because I kind of feel like I'm supposed to pull out of my pocket like some innovation <laughs> roadmap, which by the way I do not have. Um, so what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to tell a little bit of my own story. I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think is happening um, on the internet and how I think that we can perhaps influence its development in the way that we want to see it go. And of course, there's a lot of assumptions in there. Who is we and what do we want? Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So my own story is a really simple one. I spent the first half of my career learning public service values. I was a journalist at a high quality news organization and I saw my job as helping to provide people with the information that would enable them to make better decisions about their lives. And I subscribed to the old school credo, the really, really old newspaper credo of comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Then the internet came along and it became really clear really quickly that the internet was gonna enable us all to do our jobs better than we had been previously able to do them. And what it was going to let us do was um, not necessarily journalism the way we'd historically understood it, so pounding the pavement and interviewing people and publishing what they said, but it was going to enable us to do it at, at a kind of better meta level, getting information to people in new ways. 
and in transformatively better ways. And so something like Wikipedia obviously was able to do that really early, really well, because it got the intermediaries, the gatekeepers, out of the way and let real people share information with each other, which was something we hadn't been able to do before. And when we could do it, it was awesome. And so that has been awesome. And I have spent the second half of my working life learning the internet, what it's good at and what we can use it for. So the internet is still pretty young and we're still refining it every day. And so it's important to note that my vision, such as it is, is not the only vision. There are a lot of different visions. Some people, I think, primarily see the internet as a place to make a lot of money, and people are making a lot of money online. I think some people see it as a playground, a sort of maker's paradise, where you can build things and try them out and see what happens to them. I think that some people see it as an instrument of social control or perhaps as a threat to the social order. Um, and then there are people like me who see it mainly as a communications tool. It's to help people connect and communicate with each other. And so this brings me to uh, when Jeff phoned me and told me I was getting this award, he said something to the effect of, you are, of course, a communist, and so I'm not sure you should get the award. <laughs> so this brings me to the part where I have to say for Jeff, because he's sitting right here, I'm not a communist. <laughs> and Michael was right when he described me as pragmatic, because I am super pragmatic, right? And I, I know that some of the stuff that I'm going to say here tonight risks sounding like I am anti-money or anti-capitalism. And I am really, really, really not. There are a lot of public service people who find money distasteful and don't like talking about business models, and I'm not one of those people. When I first joined the Wikimedia Foundation, the first thing I did was get our financial house in order. We were making $2 million a year when I joined. Today we're making $60 million a year. That's really important because money is freedom and money is independence. We want to do a good job and you have to have a solid, stable base of funding in order to pay the salaries of the people, some of whom are in this room, um, who do the work that make the site run, right? So that was really, really important. I'm really interested in generating money and I'm also interested in generating it in the right way, right? You need a business model that supports the work that you're trying to do. I'm interested in that not just for Wikipedia, but for the whole of the space. And so that's the thing that I'm going to talk about here. So I spent the latter half of my career learning the internet. I did a lot of that at Wikipedia. I've been there for six years. When I started, there were eight of us in St. Petersburg in Florida. And today there are about 200 of us and we're in the San Francisco Bay Area. And so what that means is we're at the heart, really, of the technology revolution. I am the person whining at coming from California. It's very warm there. <laughs> um, it's where the hackathons happen. It's where there are a lot of meetups. It's really where this, there is the spirit of technological innovation that permeates the whole of the Bay Area. And so as a journalist and as a curious person, I have felt, and I've been, extraordinarily privileged to be at the heart of that and to see that. It's history in the making, right? And I'm a part of it. I'm there. Glenn Greenwald um, is in the January edition of Esquire talking about his vision for what the internet is. And what he says is, the promise of the internet has always been that it was going to be this unprecedentedly potent instrument of liberation and democratization. It was going to let you explore things and meet people who you otherwise wouldn't get to know in ways that are completely free and completely unconstrained. That's what I believe in. And that's what I feel like I'm part of at the Wikimedia Foundation. I feel like I live at a kind of an unusual intersection of um, old school public service values <coughs> the first half of my career and where they intersect with this newer world where disruptive changes in communications technology are happening that are completely transformative for the world. I think the internet is important. I am unhappy about where the internet is headed. And so I feel like the purpose of my talk today is in part to define the problem as I see it, and then in part to point towards where I think there may be solutions. So first, the problem. Who here has read uh, Tim Wu's book, The Master Switch? Everybody needs to read Tim Wu's book, The Master Switch. I reckon, thank you. Yes, there it is. <laughs> well done. That's a Wikipedian. <laughs> um, it, really is, it really is an incredible story. It is the story of disruptive, internet, disruptive communications technologies and what happens when something new gets invented. And so it talks you through the story of radio, the story of television, the story of movies, I think the telephone. And what Tim says is that 
every time something brand new is invented that breaks everything that came before it, we always have the same reaction. We always think the same thing, right? What we believe is going to happen is that it will usher in a Garden of Eden of democratization, of access to information, and of education. We believe the whole world is going to be transformed. Because I worked at the CBC for a long time, and because I am a good and earnest um, student, I used to go to the CBC Museum and look at the early schedules for radio and television for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. And so I know that what Tim Wu said is correct, right? If you look at those early schedules, what you see is you see folks teaching each other Latin, you see people playing chess, you see them running classes on stamp collecting and how to identify different kinds of stamps, you see them teaching each other calculus and geography and political science and history. So that's where we started with those communications technologies. But if you fast forward a half a century, obviously that's not where things have ended up, right? The whole thing has collapsed. Both radio and television today, some company accepted, are mostly terrible, and there isn't a lot of public service value being represented there. <clears throat> I see the same thing happening online today. So what are we seeing online? The first thing is we're seeing an awful lot of consolidation, right? Today, the vast majority of people's time online is spent on sites that are run by mega corporations, by Facebook, by Google, by Yahoo, et cetera. The list of the most popular websites in the world used to be really volatile. People used to come and go all the time from it, and now it's much more stable. It's rare for a new site to enter, for example, the top 10. The last one probably was Facebook about five years ago. The powerful sites, the big important sites, with Wikipedia accepted, they have an awful lot of money and they use it to protect their interests. And so what we've seen in the last couple of years is big internet companies hiring up a lot of lawyers, hiring up a lot of lobbyists to buy influence for themselves in DC. And we've also seen them starting to snap up their competitors, right? They want to prevent further disruptive innovation from disrupting them. When I say that, I know that it risks sounding a bit conspiratorial. It sounds like a conspiracy theory, but it's really not. I mean, it's obviously, that's just self-interested corporations. That's what they're built to do. That's what they're designed to do. It's what they're supposed to do. And so that's what they're doing. What it means, though, is that the playing field is getting less level. It's getting a lot harder to make new stuff than it used to be. When Jimmy made Wikipedia about 12 years ago, he did it from his spare bedroom at, in his apartment in Clearwater in Florida, and it had a shot at becoming something that was important. But today, it's a lot harder for a new project to break through. And if it does break through, increasingly, it's just going to be bought up by somebody else. So that's a tough situation. And it's made worse by two factors that I think are kind of additionally important. The first one is, there is so much money sloshing around in the Bay Area that the price of engineering talent has gone through the roof, right? So there's been a talent war to hire engineers in the Silicon Valley area for years, maybe for 10 years now, and the prices keep going up, and that's bad for people who want to do public service work. And the other thing is that public service people are and have always been kind of notoriously bad at figuring out the business model stuff, right? And what that means is that we aren't shaping the business models. And so the business models on the internet are increasingly being defined and they're being solidified and it's happening by the pivot model of venture capitalism or through the pivot model of venture capitalism. And so what that means is you build something, it's lovely, it's beautiful, so it attracts a lot of users. And then you pivot, once people start using it, you pivot away from the original idea towards whatever is gonna bring in your revenue. That's the model that's defining what's happening on the internet today. So I told you earlier that I care a lot about the money side, and I told you that the flavor of journalism that I subscribe to is the muckrakey kind, right? The afflicting the comfortable, the comforting the afflicted. And so what I think is that we need more sites and apps and services and products that do, I think, three things. And these are intended to be, and I think they are, subversive. So the first is they want to be built for the benefit of ordinary people. That's basic public service, right? We want to help people. The second thing is that they want to be built incorporating the participation of those ordinary people. That's the new thing that we can do now because of the internet that we could not do before. And then the third thing that I think is really important is 
that they want to be funded by the people who use them. They want to be funded by ordinary people just like Wikipedia is. And so I want to talk about that funding component. So when I joined the Wikimedia Foundation, thank you. <laughs> When I joined the Wikimedia Foundation, we got our money from a mix of sources. So we got some of it from ordinary people, not very much. We got some of it from super wealthy um, Silicon Valley people. That was great. And we also got some money from a mix of business development, um, what's called in nonprofit land, earned income. So we sold live feeds and we had uh, trademark licensing deals. And I would say that probably my signal achievement at the Wikimedia Foundation, the thing that I am most proud of, is that I streamlined and I sharpened up our revenue model. And so today, 95% of the money that we bring into the Wikimedia Foundation that funds Wikipedia comes from ordinary people. Um, we're a nonprofit. People donate online because they want to. They give us $10, $20, $100. That's how we make our money. I really, really like that model. That model makes a lot of sense. I like it because it gives us freedom and independence, and it also keeps us honest. I think you want to have a model where your revenue rises and falls with your performance, because otherwise it's too hard to tell if you're doing a good job. And so if you've got like a really fantastic fundraising team, but you're not providing very good value for your users, that's not really good. If you're providing fantastic value, but you're not very good at the money part, that's not good either. I think you want them to rise and fall together. I like our model, too, because I think it orients us towards the right people. I want the Wikimedia Foundation, I want Wikipedia paying attention to ordinary people who it's supposed to be serving, right? You pay attention to the people who pay the bills, and so I want us looking to those people. Where your money comes from, that's who you listen to. <clears throat> I think there's an opportunity. If you do it right, it works really well, and there's a risk if you do it wrong. And so I want to talk about what wrong looks like. <coughs> if your business model doesn't allow for users to pay their own costs, then you're going to have to find somebody else to pay. A couple of years ago, there's a guy on Metafilter who said famously, if you're not paying for it, you're not the customer, you're the product being sold. And I think that's true. In a reasonable case scenario, that might look something like the ordinary quid pro quo of advertising. But it might also mean blurring the line between marketing and editorial, something that journalists have a lot of unhappy experience with. And it might also mean the selling of users' private data. And those are crappy models, right? Those aren't models that help. So I know that there are people who think that the Wikipedia model doesn't work for everybody, because in order for it to work, you're going to need to have a really big audience. And I think that's a legitimate worry. I think it used to be more true. I think today it's less true um, now. And some of that is just the ordinary mechanics, right? There used to be only a very small number of people who would do things like payment processing, so there was only PayPal. Now there are multiple payment processors. They're also getting better at taking money in from around the world. They're taking more currencies. I think that everywhere in the world, regulations are gradually starting to relax, making it easier to shift money around to other countries than it used to be. The fees of the payment processors are dropping. Sites like Wikipedia, we do a ton of A-B testing and we share what we learn so other people can learn from what we have done. All of that is getting easier. But more, I think, what's actually happening is that people are changing. I think our habits and our behaviors are changing. I think that we are <coughs> gradually shifting as a society from a focus on the physical world into a focus on the mental world and the world of our imaginations. Even home ownership is dropping, right? We are owning fewer things. We are renting more. We are using things when we need them and not owning them when we don't need them. We travel more. We relocate more often. We know more people in more different countries. Distance is collapsing. I think that helps us feel empathy for each other in ways that we weren't able to do before. And I think increasingly people are willing to pay for intangibles such as knowledge, such as information. I think people will pay for the pleasure of supporting the little guy, for the jolt of satisfaction that comes from thinking you've done something good in the world. We get that jolt of satisfaction by doing something like contributing to Wikipedia as an editor, and we get it equally by supporting Wikipedia as a donor. And I think that's why we're seeing people give money to sites like Wikipedia, but not just Wikipedia, also um, Kickstarter, Donors Choose, Kiva, all kinds of things. 
these aren't self-interested transactions. They aren't made after a careful evaluation of what's in it for me, and they don't really resemble traditional charity. I don't think you have to be a nonprofit, and there are lots of organizations that are not nonprofits that are using this model. There are people funding stuff because they think it's great, because they love it, and because they want to see more of it. I think that's awesome. And I think it has a really great future. So if you take one thing away from my talk, I would like it to be this. If you're building something, I sometimes feel like my, my time at the Wikimedia Foundation has been like one massive trust fall, right? Like I've just trusted, <laughs> and it's worked out really well. Um, and I think if you're building something, you should consider a trust fall like that. You could do a rigid paywall, you could do advertising, you could do any number of conventional fundraising techniques, but I think you should consider just asking your users for help. Because I think that, as Clay Shirky said, I think a variant on this, if, if they value what you're doing, if they think you're doing a good job, they will find a way to pay you to let you continue doing it. Thank you. It's a hair's breadth difference. Um, uh, I would like to arrange for the room to interview Sue here and talk with Sue, but of course I'll, I'll take the prerogative of starting, if I may. Uh, and then we're going to have a surprise. I'll hold that off for a moment. Um, you and I were at some of the too many conferences we go to some time ago, and we were probably the only two people in the room who said we were doggedly optimistic about the future of news. Mm -hmm. You are optimistic about the future of news. I am optimistic about the future of the news, but that doesn't mean I'm optimistic about the future of the journalistic industry. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah? Okay. So define news in this optimistic future then. So I feel like I feel like we're living I, I'm gonna work on this mic. This mic is sick. I feel like we're living in um, in in a in a in a golden age of information, right? I feel like I personally, as a user, I have access to way more stuff than I ever did before. Like I remember, you know, getting the magazine as a Canadian, getting the magazine in the mail three months late from the United States, and paying through the nose for the shipping, right? And I remember when you know there was one newscast on television every night, like like the 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 scarcity days, right? And it's screamingly obvious that today we have access to so much more than we ever did before. Um, the Guardian is here in the room, I think, somewhere. Tony Decker? There he is, right? All right, so that man's trying to uh, save a, uh, a venture that I think we would agree is a good one mm -hmm. and uh, work on the NSA story. Mm -hmm. From your experience, uh, as they would say, uh, innovative experience <laughs> at Wikipedia, um, what advice do you have for Tony just to pick him out of the crowd and how to change the Guardian's business model? God, I, I, I think The Guardian is doing terrifically well. It's actually a hard one because I think The Guardian is doing really well. I think Comment is Free makes a lot of sense. I think a ton of the things The Guardian is doing make sense. I, I don't, I have no advice for well, The they're Guardian. Thinking, uh, they've been talking about a membership model for some uh -huh. time. How would you, but, but this idea that it's not just charity, it's not a self-interested mm -hmm, mm -hmm, transaction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, what does that look like? If, if somebody cares about news and cares about an informed community, yeah. Um, how do we break out of our old business models in that sense? And, and Amanda Palmer in a great TED talk talks about giving people the chance to help. Yeah. So how yeah. do we give them the chance? I think that's a lot of it. And maybe I can speak from my own experience with the New York Times, right? So the New York Times instituted a paywall. And the minute they instituted the paywall, my feelings about the Times, I'm just talking about me as a, like a user, right? My feelings about the Times changed. And I started feeling transactionally oriented towards them, like suddenly I didn't want to pay and I want to know exactly how could I not pay and how many articles was the limit and what if I open a new browser and blah, 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 right? <laughs> but it was weird, right? Because why wouldn't I pay? Like, like I love them, they're great, I want them to flourish, you know? But it makes me think about um, like behavioral economics, right? Where they have found that if you trigger transactional thinking in people, they cannot get off it, right? And so like even soft paywalls, I think soft paywalls are probably better than hard paywalls, but even a soft paywall will trigger that, I think, in users. I was thinking about this with regards to Consumer Reports the other day, too, right? Because they have a pretty hard paywall, and they're pretty good about enforcing it, and people want access to that stuff. 
And I wonder what would happen if there was some kind of experimentation where folks like the New York Times or The Guardian or, um, or Consumer Reports just asked people to give without the conventional sort of pressure tactics. NPR sometimes does this sort of pressure tactic feeling stuff, right, where they're going to make you feel guilty. And I think donors, and I learned this when I gave to Donors Choose, donors want to feel joyful, right? They don't want to feel bad. They want to feel good. And so if you just invite them and then thank them, I think sometimes that's a better model than making them feel bad. It's like individual philanthropy. Yeah, well, it is sense, individual right? it is philanthropy. That, yes. Yeah. Um, one or two more, and then, uh, uh, OK. Well, let me ask, I'm going to ask one question first, then I'll get a read check. One of the big surprises for me in Wikipedia was that it became the center of news, that uh, when any major event happens, the snapshot of what we know right now is reliably Yes, reliably, there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's not a function that I would have guessed. Now, when you start a platform, people take it over and they use it ways that you can't imagine. To me, that's the definition of a platform. People found a use in it you didn't imagine they found it. So how should news organizations look at the lesson of Wikipedia in breaking news, just to pick one, or in backgrounders, which is the other area where Wikipedia is a, is a tremendous asset, mm -hmm. uh, how should we news organizations, we journalists, look at the relationship that we have with Wikipedia. Should we be doing the same things? Should we be, you know, do what you do best, link to the rest, link to them? No. What's our relationship? <clears throat> yeah, I always think it's weird when journalists want to duplicate. And they used to do it a lot more, right? But journalists used to want to duplicate Wikipedia. I remember when I was at the CBC, my boss briefly wanted me to start a Wikipedia for Canada. And then we, and then we that was a long time ago. <laughs> and, then, and then we researched it. We realized that Wikipedia was already covering Canada terrifically well, right? But every now and then, journalists want to do, they want to do backgrounders that, in effect, are, are duplicating. And I think rather that like each new technical innovation allows the thing that preceded it to become more itself, right? Like the advent of television, let newspapers take a step backwards into analysis, a step further back, right? The, when I made radio, we used to think to ourselves all the time, you know, what do people know about Sunni Muslims and Shia Muslims? Do we have to do what we called a primer, right? Um, and we don't anymore because now Wikipedia exists and that's what it's for. So rather than duplicating it, I think if I were working in journalism, what I would want to do is get all my stuff into Wikipedia, right? so that people are coming to me. So they learn to trust me as a source, and then they can come to me for the breaking news. Yeah, I look at it as, as the article. Not only do we unbundle publications, we unbundle the article into assets and paths, and Wikipedia provides assets for this. Jim. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jim Schaffer from WNYC. I have a very tactical question. You, you talked both about the flaws of the NPR model, perhaps, and also about doing a lot of testing at Wikipedia. So the, the message that I see when I go to Wikipedia that's asking for money mm -hmm. is, am I seeing today the most optimized version of that? Have you yes. A-B tested that? And, and, and how is that, how do you differentiate that from what Ira Glass or we do? Yeah, we've done tons of A-B testing. And actually, if you go to a site called meta.wikimedia.org, you can search for it. You can find reams of material on it. But yeah, we've done tons. And what we found, and it's really interesting because it's counterintuitive to the conventional sort of um, what we think we understand about why people donate, right? When I first started the Wikimedia Foundation, we did what I now think of as very, very embarrassing fundraising. It was all my fault, right? Like I was doing it. <laughs> and we had pictures of sad looking children. And things like that. <laughs> Seriously, we did. Like, like we didn't know how to do it. And all we knew was, what I knew from radio and what is also, I think, conventional fundraising wisdom, which is personalize it, you know, somebody wants something, help them want it, you know, help them succeed, whatever. So it was all very storytelling oriented. And what we realized over time was, for us anyway, um, all you needed to do was tell people what you were going to do with the money, right? Like they liked the thing. They wanted the thing to continue existing. And so all we ended up saying to people was, I think it's some message about servers and how many staff there are. It's just like factual, right? It's not super compelling. It just tells you, here's what we do with it. And people are like, OK, that sounds plausible. I will give you money. Um, we have also discovered some weird little things that we had no idea and cannot explain. We realized, I think, last year, that, uh, yeah, <laughs> that um, if we put the image of the person, the, the, the person you see in the banners, you used to see Jimmy a lot and various foundation staff and Wikipedians, 
if they had a green background behind them, we made something like 35 cents more per, like 35% more per, um, per banner click. We don't know why, right? But the green background, we tested it. We started Photoshopping in green backgrounds behind everybody's picture, and we made all this money. It was very strange. Other questions? Tony Denker from The Guardian. Congratulations, and thank you for your kind words. Uh, we were quite inspired by Wikipedia, I think, because I think uh, we had a similar insight, which is that the truth gets better the more everybody contributes to it. And I think our views on paywalls started from a journalistic rather than an economic point of view, which was exactly that. But one of the things we struggle with now, and I'd love your insight on this, is what is the role of the expert, if any, in this new world of omnipotent expertise and information? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a personal opinion on that. I feel like, um, I feel like uh, what the expert can do that uh, nobody else can do is to shine the light on something, right? To say, this is important, this is not normal, this is worth you thinking about, here's what you should think about, right? I find myself seeking out, um, for example, I, 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 I read a lot of material about economics and I don't understand it terrifically well and I seek out economists on their blogs and other sort of publications where I think they can help me understand what it means, right? And so the role of the ex expert, I think, is to extract the meaning from something. We all have access to tons of um, facts and data on sites like Wikipedia and we have access to tons of great storytelling and tons of opinion and so forth. But I think that the, the old school giving of context to the news and telling us why something matters, I think that's what an expert can do. More questions? Hi, I want to take you back to your very interesting comments on the connection between the, quantity, the quality of the work you do and the quantity of income, and that they should be tied and they should rise and fall together. It's always struck me that that was one of the problems for newspapers. Of course, it was great that advertising paid for it, but as a newspaper editor, I was well aware that it really was, you know, people would call me and say, well, I'm paying for this newspaper, and I thought, like, hell, you are not. <laughs> and it made a difference. It's part of why we became more and more detached from our audiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you agree with that, and do you see that really changing <coughs> today for? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I, I, used to, I used to think that advertising was not a good model, and I worried about the separation of church and state and all of that, like everybody, right? Um, I put ads on cbc.ca when I was there, and I did it because we needed money, and we had no, it was the best possible way to make money for us at the time. And now, as we see new business models exploding on the internet, honestly, advertising is starting to look pretty awesome in comparison to a lot of the stuff that is happening. I really do think that. Because I know that it's not a direct correlation, but at least there's some relationship there, right? The problem with advertising is that eventually it's going to take you to the place of sensationalizing and so forth, right? You know, the sort of race to the bottom. Everything is Britney Spears all the time. Um, when we first got actual metrics in for who was reading our stories, when I was at the CBC, we were astonished to find that everybody reads Britney Spears. CBC um, audience is not exempted, right? Um, and so advertising can have that kind of popularizing effect, which can turn easily into sensationalizing. But I don't think it's the worst model, right? Because at least there is some form of relationship. A few more minutes for questions, and then we'll have our surprise. Uh, Dick McPherson, I work with Mark First on some public media uh, forums and other things. Uh, you mentioned uh, your success with uh, uh, Wikipedia asking individuals to contribute, and they do, which is pretty similar to the model of public radio and television. But mm -hmm. the examples you mentioned of Kickstarter and Global Giving, those kind of things, are very, very social. And I'm, I'm interested in your comments on the extent to which, because a lot of group giving now, whether that's it's more fun to give on Kickstarter or there's a economically stressed middle class, I'm not sure the reasons. But I'm curious about, as people gather and want to give in groups, what's your observation and any, any plans we should know about for uh, social fundraising? Yeah, I don't have any. I don't have any plans for it myself. But um, but uh, but I think it's super interesting to watch the phenomenon, right? And I mean, people are starting to figure out on places like Kickstarter, which I don't know tons and tons about. I just know what the average person knows. But when I look at Kickstarter, you can see how people are getting good at constructing an ask, right? And it may or may not have a lot of relationship to the win, like to what the value is of the thing that they're doing. You know, 
Um, I give most frequently to donors choose, um, which does not have a, it doesn't have a, you're not doing it, you are doing it with other people, but it's not a crowd, it's not a crowdsourced model where you're upvoting or anything like that. But I give to donors choose. And, and I was startled the first time I did because I didn't realize what happens when you give to them. And when you give to donors choose, you, it's to students, right? It's to schools. And a month later in the mail, you get a manila envelope of colorful thank you notes from little kids, <laughs> which is like incredible because it's like you're on the internet and you're living in the abstract world and all of that. And then you get crayon stuff in your mail that you can put on your refrigerator, right? So I was struck in that. I was struck by, again, the collapsing of distance, right? The idea that at the same time, you're living in a very abstract space, but you're also living in a super concrete space. It's real people. I thought it was very clever of them, too. Right, to make sure that people got that really tactical, tangible, tangible payoff. Hi, Mika Sifri. Um, so uh, that's interesting what you were saying about A-B testing of your fundraising. So um, given how well certain kinds of A-B testing is working these days for certain news sites, I'm wondering if we should expect uh, Wikipedia to start having articles titled the first four sentences will really depress you, but the fifth one will make you feel great. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we actually collect nothing <laughs> about our users. All we collect is the, is the click on the banners. But really, like we, we don't collect any private data from anybody. We don't collect anything we don't want to keep. We're super, super privacy conscious. So you mentioned that you like the ad model, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and also that uh, but that usually works at scale. And you also made that great point about how there are no big, very few big sites, you know, and nothing new is breaking into the top 10 mm -hmm. recently. Mm -hmm. um, so, and yet you're optimistic about journalism. So where do you see the opportunities for all of our students at institutions like this? Yeah, it's such a good question, right? Because um, I don't know, like, I don't know what happens to the, the, the act of functioning as a professional journalist, right? It's clear that some of it goes away, right? Like some of it goes away because Wikipedia is doing some of it, right? Some of it goes away because um, the world doesn't need 50 trillion movie reviewers, right? I was a movie reviewer when I was first at the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation and I was appallingly bad and the world did not need me, right? And it was okay, it was like not a big important priority of mine, I just did it because someone had to churn out the movie review every week, right? Um, so to a certain extent probably what happens is um, the most excellent do really well, right? And then, and then there's not a lot of work for the people who are less excellent, like I would not have been the movie reviewer at the end of time, right? Um, but beyond that, I mean, there, there clearly is going to be work for journalists, right? Um, doing the hard work of pounding the pavement and all of that. I think it's just still shaking out what that's exactly going to look like. Some of it is gone, though, and, and going. I like where you started with the definition of journalism, which is, which is having better informed communities, people able to better run their lives, better organize their communities because they have information. Mm -hmm. And also I think we have the idea now that we have flows of information that occur, and journalists have to add value to that. I think we saw that with Andy Carbon and, and the Arab Spring, mm -hmm. uh, adding journalistic value in, 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 in confirming facts, debunking rumors, adding context, making the phone call, getting the question answered that's not in that flow, and so on. And we have to think we're not the entire gatekeeper to it all, but there are assets like Wikipedia we can take advantage of. Hi, my name is Emily, and I'm with um, an organization called The Lamp. We're a nonprofit media education organization. And one of the things that we work with a lot with our students, it's actually a very good segue, um, in our news literacy workshops is this idea of gatekeepers. A lot of them don't really stop and think about it. And so I was struck by what you said in the beginning, that Wikipedia could flourish because you got the gatekeeper out of the way. Um, but it seems like there is also something of a need for gatekeepers at the same time in order to make sure that you get quality information and vetted information. Um, so I wanted to, and that's, you know, that, that line is changing as, um, mm -hmm. you know, there are a bazillion free websites that maybe are not so great, but then there's some that are maybe all right. And uh, I wanted to know what you thought about the future of gatekeeping as far as the future of, of news and where those two kind of come together and where's the, the middle ground. Yeah, I think, I think where gatekeeping fits in 
is in the expert function, right? I think it's in the function of this is hard, I don't understand it, tell me what to make of this, right? A super complex topic where someone has spent their whole life learning about it and understanding it, they're a leader in their field, right? Those people aren't necessarily professional journalists. In fact, they may not be, because part of the definition of a journalist mostly has been a generalist, right? Somebody you can plug and play and they can cover City Hall or the dollar or whatever, right? So I think that that's the function that gatekeeping is gonna play. I do think for something like Wikipedia, what, what one of the lessons, I mean, Wikipedia, we've, there are a bunch of lessons you can extract from it, right? But one of the lessons of Wikipedia, I think, is how much, and this is a little humbling for us all, I think, but how much convenience matters to people, right? Wikipedia is so easy. And I think the trade-off that people have made in using it is in part an acknowledgement that, yeah, I mean, it's gonna be wrong once in a blue moon, and that's okay because it's so easy for me to use. I'm on my phone, it's the top Google result. It almost always has the right answer. When it doesn't have the right answer, you know, I, I move on, right? I actually don't necessarily value accuracy as highly as I do convenience. But there are some realms where we do. I lost track of time because, as Alberto noticed when we came in, the clock's up there. None of them is, has any relationship to any others. So, well, Alberto's suggestion, we're going to call that a work of modern art and put a signature on it as the artist. Um, so I have one more question for you, and then we'll get the surprise. Uh, you've announced that you're leaving Wikimedia. Mm -hmm. your, your colleagues are crying in front of us right now. Um, what's next for Sue Gardner? I have no idea. What do you want I have to be? no idea. I have no idea. So I'm, I'm leaving Wikimedia because I am, and I, I'm really, I, 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 I think optimism reasonably well, but honestly, I am really concerned about the future of what's happening online. I'm like, like I read Tim Wu's book three years ago. It resonated for me. I thought it was true. Fast forward three years now, and it is coming true. And so I'm, I'm really deeply disconcerted, and I want to play a role in that. And so what I've been trying to figure out, and what I am currently trying to figure out is, with a playing field that is as non-level as it is, what is the intervention point? What is the point at which one person um, can make a difference, right? And ensure that we get the internet that we want and we deserve. And it's a hard challenge to figure that out. I've discarded hundreds of ideas. <laughs> I've brainstormed many things. I've thought many things. I've had many, many conversations. I'm getting closer, but I don't know yet what it is. Can't wait to see it. In a I was sort of surprised you didn't turn your life plan into a wiki, but that's, that's <laughs> probably why. That may still come. Um, all right, so we have a moment for surprise. When we came up with this award, uh, when Knight came up with this award, the idea was that we were going to find an innovator who inspires us to innovate more and to learn from, and we did that, Knight did that extremely well in fighting Sue. But the idea was also to give forward. And so we gave Sue, not only did she have to come here to accept her award in cold, miserable weather she's complained about, <laughs> not only did she have to give us an inspiring talk, we thank you for that, uh, and, and put up with our questions. But finally, she had to do her homework and come up with a new enterprise that will be the recipient uh, itself of a $25,000 Knight Innovation Grant. So I now turn to Sue. She did a lot of homework. She talked to a lot of people, a lot of reporting to give the award for this little surprise of the extra second Knight Innovation Award. It's true, it's true. So I did, I did a ton of work because I am Canadian and I'm very diligent and I'm very <laughs> conscious and I, I really did. So I did some crowdsourcing, I did some talking on Twitter and Facebook and stuff. And then um, I had some phone calls with people and I did a spreadsheet and I made up, there were no criteria. <laughs> I thought, you know, Knight is very clever to like outsource this whole piece. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, and so, and so I made up criteria because there were none and I cross-referenced things and I brainstormed, I did a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and then in the end, and I'm not sure how much I'm supposed to do here. Am I supposed to say the name sure. and then it will be an exciting reveal? reveal? Okay, <laughs> so I will just say the name. <laughs> so um, after much, much investigation and discussion and consultation with many, many, many people and for many, many, many good reasons, which I will not enumerate all of, um, but I'm giving the award to muckrock, not .org, .com, right? Mm. Muckrock.com, which is a really great thing that does stuff with FOIA, I can never say that with a straight face. Freedom of Information Act requests, it processes them for people who want them to be carried forward and then it reports on the outcomes of them and they're doing a lot of very good stuff right now on drones.
got the notice about this Thursday night, I thought it was a prank. Um, it was, I had just finished uh, our budgeting for the next year, um, and I was really excited because we could hire one more half-time person, and now I have to redo all my budgeting, which is a very good problem to have. Uh, I, do, I should have a disclaimer. I know this is for, for rewarding innovative news um, and sort of charting the future of, of news. Um, but uh, I'm not a journalist, uh, as determined by the NSA, Homeland Security, and the state of Virginia has determined that Muckrock is, is not a journalism organization, despite the fact that we publish news daily, despite the fact that I work at the Boston Globe. My editor was a little disappointed to hear that. My mom was a little relieved. Um, <laughs> Um, but a few years ago, I, I was talking with my co-founder, and we came up with a fairly radical idea of what would happen if you made the public records process public um, in terms of it, who's filed a public records request before. It's a very lonely process. It's one-on-one. <laughs> -on -one. You're going up against an agency that has probably more lawyers than you, definitely a lot more time than you, and you're just going back and forth like with this, this mail-bound version of ping pong. Um, and my first public records request had all failed. I, I was in upstate New York filing records requests, FOIL uh, here. Um, and the police department just said, we're not going to give that to you. And they didn't even justify that. And so I said, well, I can't afford a lawyer, so I guess that's the end of the road. Um, so we looked at what the journalism was that was important to us and how much it is based on records you know, from the government, from other sources. And uh, we said, look, if we just sort of take this process and make it public from the beginning, somebody files a request and it creates a new page on our website, and anybody, a lot of people say, hey, I just filed this request, tweet out a link to it. And then as soon as that request is updated, it's updated on the website. And so when an agency like that upstate police department doesn't respond for two years, that is recorded and everybody can see that. And um, so I was like, you know, this, there could be something here. Well, you know, at the time, uh, there was this great new site called Patch that was sort of scaling journalism out um, and doing a lot of hyper-local journalism. Um, I was like, you know, they'd be a perfect customer. We can sell to newsrooms and build a business on this. Uh, so I asked my 50 closest friends if they thought this was a good idea, a mix of lawyers and journalists. They said it's a terrible idea. Nobody will ever pay for it. Um, and it won't work. And so uh, because I was either that or get really good at Guitar Hero, um, I went ahead and built the site anyways, and uh, you know a few years later, 8,000 requests filed, 180,000 pages published, um, a few jail threats, weekly death threats. Um, we're now sort of self-sustaining. Um, we charge our users uh, to file requests. We wanted to build a news site that wasn't based on paywalls, wasn't based on advertising, because uh, as somebody in the industry, I do worry about those corrupt enforces. And so we charge people not to view anything, not to see anything, uh, not to read the information that the government is making, but to participate. Um, and for very few of the things you can participate, you can follow requests free, you can ask questions for free, get advice for free, um, and we only charge people at the very end. And uh, it's been an amazing experience. Um, so a little bit about the mechanics of the site. You just sign up, uh, put in your credit card information, and we guide you through the entire request process. Um, seven other groups have sort of said that they're gonna do something similar. People are like, we can clone what you're doing. It's not that complex. Uh, so far, none have launched. Um, we're waiting for a little more competition here. Um, but uh, it's been effective. Um, our users, we have a group of users who started filing requests with the NSA a few months ago, and they were surprised when they actually got some documents back on a French security firm called Vupin. Um, and so now they've started crowdsourcing a major project where they're going after hundreds of contracts with the NSA and looking into who are our foreign suppliers of surveillance equipment. Uh, that's something I never would have thought to think of. Um, and talking a little bit earlier about sort of putting other people in control and sort of what happens when you give up control. Um, our user base, we planned on, like I said, Patch. Patch, as it turns out, was not a great customer. Uh, we had a lot of negotiations with them and uh, never went anywhere. Um, but we have Tea Party activists, we have marijuana activists, we have uh, parents who just want to know what their school funds are being spent on. We have users who file for their own files. Um, we have sort of ordinary people, we have researchers, we have independent journalists who find they can't be taken seriously when they're asking uh, tough questions and reporting on important stories. Um, and we have whistleblowers. You can sign up for our site anonymously and put in a pseudonym. 
So we've had a couple cases where city employees say, hey, they're screwing around with the expense account, but I don't want to lose my job. And so they, they see the documents, and this is a way to safely leak them for that. Um, and it's been an amazing experience. Uh, we recently worked on another local surveillance project. Uh, is anybody familiar with automated license plate recognition? So uh, police departments get all these really fun toys from Homeland Security. Um, and so our users started filing requests for it. And uh, we filed a request for how Boston was using uh, license plate readers. They were scanning all this information in. Um, we filed a request for it, and it turns out they were recording this data for four times as long as they said they would and not properly protecting it. So because of just before we could even write a story about it, just the request canceled the program. So, um, you know, people, people come up and tell me and say FOIA is useless, um, public records can't work, and, and we can't find reporting on the stories we're doing. The amazing thing, the surprising thing to me has been our amazing user base and sort of them making that happen, uh, you know, and, and the surprising directions they've taken the site that I never could have imagined. Um, so anyways, I've spoken way too long, but I can't thank you enough. This is amazing and a huge honor, and we're excited to see what we can do with it. Thank you all for coming, and please enjoy the fellowship. Thank you very much.